Atrial fibrillation is the most common heart rhythm abnormality affecting more than 5% of patients over 70 years of age in the UK. It occurs for a number of different reasons, and there are risk factors that are known to be associated with atrial fibrillation. So these include ischemic heart disease, which means a heart attack previously, diabetes, hypertension, and obesity and sleep apnea. These are major risk factors which would predispose you to developing atrial fibrillation. However, there is one also fairly common cause of atrial fibrillation which typically occur in patients who are relatively fit and healthy without any of these risk factors. And these uh, patients do suffer with what I see quite often is vaguely mediated atrial fibrillation, and that is atrial fibrillation due to uh, being very fit and healthy, and it seems a paradox, but these patients who uh, go on long b uh, bike rides or run um, endurance races such as the marathon or triathlon can also in time develop the propensity to developing atrial fibrillation. And these fo this form of atrial fibrillation is very unique and it's, it's called or typically referred to as vaguely mediated atrial fibrillation. It's the kind of symptoms that may occur at night whilst you're sleeping to wake you up from sleep or after a large meal or a heavy exercise burden when you're recovering from that exercise burden. So there are as you can see, a number of different reasons why one may start to develop atrial fibrillation, uh, and I've listed some of the causes there. Atrial fibrillation has been described as a flip-flopping of your heart in your chest. It's characterized by a very irregularly irregular rhythm. So not only is the rhythm out of sorts, where one heartbeat following the next is completely erratic, also, the volume of the heartbeat, so the strength of each contraction, may be slightly different from beat to beat. So patients can feel alternate pounding in the chest, followed by soft beats, but also notice the irregularity, both rapid and slow. And so atrial fibrillation uh, presents in a variety of different ways and gives patients different kind of symptoms because of what it is. Some of the more common symptoms patients describe include palpitations, lightheadedness, shortness of breath, feeling faint or dizzy, and some uh, even a very unusual or impending sense of doom that something is very wrong in their heart. Atrial fibrillation if sustained and particularly if the rate of atrial fibrillation is not controlled, which means heart rates are typically running at above 100 beats per minute, can lead to what we call heart failure. Imagine this, you are running along at a heart rate of more than 100 beats per minute, sometimes up to 150, for prolonged periods, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Over time, the heart pushed in this way can start to weaken. And if it does weaken in that way, you can get a heart that is starting to display signs of heart failure. So one of the more important complications of atrial fibrillation and the reason to try and get a diagnosis fairly rapidly is to prevent the heart from failing. <clears throat> and heart failure obviously causes symptoms like fatigue, tightness, and importantly, shortness of breath. Now, there is another very major complication of atrial fibrillation. And this occurs because the blood does not flow freely through the heart in atrial fibrillation. And what this may cause is a pooling and stagnating of blood. And when this happens, blood can form little clots that can be uh, pushed into the brain. And so one of the most devastating complications of atrial fibrillation is a stroke. And this is the in my mind, the most important reason to be aware if you have or have not got atrial fibrillation. So please learn to simply do a pulse check, which is feeling on your thumb side down, about two centimeters from this crease, your wrist crease, and actually feel with two fingers and you feel your pulse and look and count for the regularity and the strength of contraction of each pulse. This is one top tip 
uh, to self-diagnose atrial fibrillation and if you feel your pulse flip-flopping or being very irregular, please see your doctor. Take it over a minute, count the number of pulses or count the number of contractions you can feel in your heart after one minute and that is defined as your pulse rate. We think of two major strategies for treatment. The first is to make a quick diagnosis and to assess your risk of having a stroke. If you are deemed at high risk of having a stroke, and there are some risk factors that your doctors will use, so it's useful to know these factors that I'm about to say, then please tell your doctor. So a history of heart failure, a history of diabetes, hypertension, uh, age is a risk factor for stroke greater than 65, uh, sex as well, so being female slightly increases your risk of stroke. These are the major risk factors that would predict your risk of stroke. And if you have one or more of these factors, usually your doctor will start you on a drug to cause the blood to be less susceptible to clotting. And these newer agents that we use nowadays would be called the direct oral anticoagulants, something like apixaban, rivaroxaban, dabigatran, or edoxaban, which are all replacing warfarin. Now, so we talked about two things. One thing was the stroke prevention, which is the most important thing. The second thing to consider is what we would do to control the rhythm in atrial fibrillation. So the rhythm in atrial fibrillation can either be abnormal all the time or some of the time. If it's abnormal all the time, this is called persistent atrial fibrillation. That means you're in it 24 seven. If you're in atrial fibrillation some of the time, this is called paroxysmal atrial fibrillation or the intermittent form. The drug therapy for these two sorts of atrial fibrillation can be subtly different, but essentially most commonly we would use something like a beta blocker, a drug that is has the name ending with olol, something like bisoprolol or metoprolol or etanolol. These are drugs given to calm the heart rate down. Now, if the drugs don't lead to a sufficient improvement in symptoms, then the next strategy moving forwards from that is a catheter ablation strategy. A catheter ablation strategy for atrial fibrillation involves inserting little tubes in both groins in a keyhole cardiac surgical approach. And this ablation is performed generally under full general anesthesia, although in some cases it can be done under local anesthesia. And the procedure takes between an hour and two hours. And the aim of the procedure is to target areas in the heart that are responsible for driving atrial fibrillation. And this procedure is typically aimed at isolating those firing spots in the heart that drive atrial fibrillation called the pulmonary veins. So you may come across this term, a pulmonary vein isolation procedure, which is what we would do to treat atrial fibrillation with a catheter ablation strategy. So there's some situations in atrial fibrillation which should prompt urgent admission to hospital. If you have severe unrelenting chest pain, if you have extreme shortness of breath, and if you're dizzy or you faint whilst having the palpitations that are typical of atrial fibrillation, you should seek urgent medical attention and attend the hospital immediately. Now, it may be that you have these symptoms for a short while, let's say 30 seconds or 10 seconds, and then things subside again. And it may be a familiar symptom for you because you've had atrial fibrillation repeatedly, in that instance, you may not need to seek urgent medical attention in the hospital, but you, you should really make an early appointment to see your general practitioner to get referred to a cardiologist, ideally a cardiologist with a special interest in atrial fibrillation, a so-called electrophysiologist or an electrician of the heart. And these Cardiologists are specialized cardiologists to deal specifically with all approaches for atrial fibrillation, including the uh, third line catheter ablation approach that we talked about previously. So what is the success rate for a catheter ablation strategy? Now, this really depends on a number of 
uh, factors. Uh, firstly, whether your atrial fibrillation is the intermittent form or so-called paroxysmal atrial fibrillation or a persistent form, which is when you have atrial fibrillation all the time. The catheter ablation success rate is higher for a paroxysmal atrial fibrillation patient, uh, reaching a ceiling, I would say, of 80 to 85 percent. And it may sometimes mean that patients get more than one procedure to achieve that ceiling success rate of 85 percent. Now, when we think about the other group of patients with persistent atrial fibrillation, the answer is much more difficult to give because it will depend on other risk factors. For example, if you have strong uh, sleep apnea that is untreated, so very severe sleep apnea, which means every night you're waking up with breathing difficulties, if you have diabetes or hypertension, or if you have had atrial fibrillation lasting for more than four years in a persistent form, then the success rates for a catheter ablation come right down to below 50% even with the best ablation in the world, because the heart has moved on, progressed, and structurally developed changes, that means it's more difficult to get rid of the problem with a catheter ablation strategy. In a nutshell, if you have a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, please see somebody soon to discuss it, and don't wait too long, because the longer you remain in atrial fibrillation, the you run the risk of the success rates for any treatment, whether it's drugs or even catheter ablation, getting lower and lower with time as the atrial fibrillation substrate in your heart sits and becomes stubborn and doesn't want to budge whatever you throw at it.